We're up to 1 Kings 2. Our dear Father, thank you that we could be together. Thank you for your kindness to us. And especially we praise you that you are a person who has showed us things that you're at work in doing in the, in the monarchy. And uh, as we come to this, uh, this phase, really, in the, in the undivided monarchy of Saul and David and Solomon, we'd like to understand what's happening here. And we ask that you'd give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Last time we met, we saw how David, uh, on his uh, deathbed, really gave his son Solomon some, um, uh, well, some advice, really. And, uh, and he explained to him that uh, he had given people his word that he wouldn't kill them. <coughs> but he thought that they obviously deserved it. And, um, and he suggested that he should be wise. And we thought he might have had his tongue in his cheek, but what we discover is that Solomon here uh, has actually um, found an occasion to actually take the life of um, Adonijah, who approaches Bathsheba. And we, and we recall that what, that, that what Solomon does in 1 Kings 2, 13 to 25, this is as far as we got that night, um, is that he understood that um, Adonijah had approached through his mother, Bathsheba, and uh, had used her relationships with the king to get his own way. And he took that just as a manipulative thing, and, uh, and so he has undone him and he's put him to death. We're picking up 26, 1 Kings 2, verse 26. Abiathar, the priest of the king, said, Go to Anathoth, to your own field, for you deserve to die, but I will not put you to death this time because you carried the ark of the Lord God before my father David and because you were afflicted in everything with which my father was afflicted. And so Solomon dismissed Abiathar from being priest to the Lord in order to fulfil the word of the Lord which he had spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. That's a long way back in 1 Samuel 2. But you remember that was the oh. pr the prophetic yeah. yeah the prophecy was that um, that um, th they would lack a man and 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 that uh, there would always be someone who was dying young in their in, in their family. Now the news came to Joab for he had followed Adonijah, although he had not followed Absalom. So in other words, when Absalom had revolted, we take it that Adon that um, uh, Joab had got into that through Adonijah, so he's loyal. Joab fled to the tent of the Lord and took hold of the corn horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon that Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord, and behold, he's beside the altar. You see, he, of course, is looking for, uh, for um, mercy. And Solomon sent Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go fall upon him. And so Beniah came to the tent of the Lord and said to him, Thus the king has said, Come out. But he said, No, 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 I'll die here. And Beniah brought the king word again, Thus spoke Joab, and thus he answered me. The king said, Well, do as he's spoken, and fall upon him and bury him, that you may remove from me in my father's house the blood which Joab shed without cause. And the Lord will return his blood on his own head, because he fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and killed them with the sword, while my father David did not know it. Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. You remember that were the cases. And you remember in both cases, David really was, well, David distanced himself from this political act. So shall their blood return on the head of the Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But to David and his descendants and his house and his throne, may there be peace from the Lord forever. So Solomon's already talking as somebody who is understanding David's dynasty is now going to go on forever. And as we've said, this is the reason why it moves to a succession by son, because formerly it's been by anointing. But in this case, it has been just simply that succession. And the king appointed Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army in his place, and the king appointed Zadok, the priest, in the place of Abiathar. So this is a changing of the guard, most certainly. It's also mopping up David's issues and the king actually ha finds ways, and and here's an next, and this is the next example. Uh, so these, 
two chapters are telling you how this is, this mopping up is taking place. Now, you remember Shimei? Shimei was the guy who cursed David and, and, and called him baldy and threw dirt on him when, he was, when Absalom's rebellion was taking place. And David pardoned him and uh, was gracious towards him. And you remember we said that the, that the circumstance was that David himself wasn't sure if God had deserted him either. And so he was wondering if Shimei was right. And so it wasn't as if he was saying, oh, well, there you go. You know, that's not right. The answer is he didn't know if it was right or not. So uh, here's the way it works. The king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, build for yourself a house in Jerusalem and live there. And do not go out from there to any place. For it will happen on the day you go out and cross over the brook Kidron, Kidron, you will know for certain that you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. Shimei said to the king, The word is good. As my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. And so he lived in Jerusalem many days. So he's confining him to the city. Uh, It's a form of essentially uh, just... um, yeah, pretty much as a form of, <laughs> of confinement. Came about at the end of three years that two of the servants of Shimeo ran away to Achish, the son of Maaka, king of Gath, and they told Shimeo, saying, Your servants are in Gath. Shimeo rose, saddled his donkey, and went to Gath to Achish to look for his servants. And Shimeo went and brought his servants from Gath, and it was told Solomon that he'd gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had returned. So the king sent and called, and he said, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and solemnly warn you, saying, You will know for certain on the day you depart, go anywhere, you shall surely die. He said, The word which I have heard is good. You said, The word I've heard is good. You took it, okay. Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the command which I've laid on you? The king also said to Shimei, You know all the evil which you acknowledge in your heart, which you did to my father David, and therefore the Lord shall return your evil on your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So do you see what's happening here? He's cleaning up the old, but actually he's, he's asserting the blessing on his own throne. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and fell upon him so that he died. This is code for killing him. And thus the kingdom was established in the hands of Solomon in the view of our writer. Uh, the kingdom is established and it's solid. And there's a justice way with Solomon is carried out. Of yes, state. there is. Solomon is prepared to wait yeah. and he's prepared to give a man a confinement base. If he And if he breaks it, well, then he reaps what he sows. And so what Solomon is actually doing, isn't it, is... It's true, when, when he does break it, and he does says, you did this to my father David, that's true. But it's not for that reason. The actual immediate reason is, you promised, you broke your promise, and this is now how it's going to be. And so for this reason, um, what we're seeing is that um, our writer understands that Solomon has established himself, and he's established himself by justice in an immediate setting, although there are old things to remember, but they are not for that reason. That's not the immediate contemporary reason. And so the kingdom is established. Now we're going to try and look at just how he tries to consolidate because it's it's his consolidation practice which is his great undoing. Um, Girls and daughters are of great advantage. Uh, because you can marry them off. Uh, n- not only that. Um, marriage is an important matter in the ancient world, not just simply because of the young couple, if they're young or old, or, or the couple who marry, uh, because the meaning of marriage is not contained at all in the, in the actual marriage of the couple. Everyone says, it, as we would say, well, it's really their day. The answer is it's not, actually. <laughs> it's, not, it's never the day of the couple. It's the day of the community. And, uh, and the great important thing is that if you look particularly at my preparation for marriage material about which is going through the 1662 Anglican liturgy, what does it think it's saying is the meaning of marriage? Is that everything is done with reference to the community. So in the ancient days, you published the bands of marriage and you... you 
And if um, George from village A was marrying uh, Henrietta from village B, well, then you went to B and you said, ah, we publish the bans of marriage, where bans is an old word for um, an announcement. We publish an announcement that George is intending to marry Henrietta. And we do that in her hometown so that everybody who knows Henrietta, in fact, and in life, can say, hey, wait on, she's married to, Jane, to Henry. And that would be odd. And so, in other words, you maintained uh, good order and good societal and community order, and therefore not disorder, by actually doing these things. Now, today we have a, a government status who recognises everybody's birth and all of us are, all of us are logged somewhere. Uh, even in that great Western land, somewhere there's, you're logged. And it's important to know that um, in that respect, they no longer publish bans in Village A and Village B. But what's important to see is a marriage is a communal affair. And because it's a communal affair, it, has, uh, it begins to start to put together families. And this is a much more important issue than actually the marriage of the couple. What we've done in our Western society is made marriage to be... Um, uh, my doing and my wife's doing and your doing and so on and we, and we focus on the couple and we think it's a happy day and it is a happy day for them but in actual fact it's it's about families really and that of course is the great difficulty today because most often people don't invite families they just all go to Whitworth Island and get married and come back or whatever so you mean extended families extended families yes so the joining of two houses is very decisively a matter of what marriage means, communally speaking, and therefore legally speaking, and therefore with implications for how life is lived between communities speaking. So this is quite an important thing to understand. And you mustn't think that Solomon is in some way, as, as he's often portrayed, as a man who's got a large sexual appetite and is going to have as many wives as he can. Not at all. He, he's a man not of war. Uh, he's not a military genius, uh, that David certainly was, or David was attended by the Lord in these matters. So Solomon's reaped a kingdom which he has to maintain, and he does that by a civil means, by a peaceful means. Now, it turns out to be a problem to him because marriage also opens a door into a relationship, but we'll come to that. Do you think Solomon is hearing from God? about doing these things? Yeah. Um, well, he's certainly doing things that are, that are legal, peaceful, uh, and are cementing alliances between hitherto non-joined, pardon me, families. So, yeah, he's, 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 finding, he's finding a way to do it which is acceptable to the Gentile nation as well as to the Jewish nation. The trouble is... He's going to marry outside in, in the, his own people. And that's go going to Pharaoh. Yes, he's, he's, yes, he's, very, going, to, very he's going to cause a problem. And, and so what's happening is we're losing uh, sight of the fact that God is saying to the people when they first began and entered the promised land, you will not intermarry mm. with... I mean, this was, you know, isn't it such a big deal at the time. And... And think of Phineas, think of the, the plague, think of all those things. God had done some pretty serious things. Well, now, Solomon is now raising an issue of... Now, do you remember? This is why it's important to do this preamble, or we're just not going to see the issue. Do you remember when they first asked for a king, they said, we want a king like the Gentile kings, who will go out and, and wage war for us and lead our armies. So we want a military leader. And Solomon is an extension of that, although he isn't one. <clears throat> His whole point is, right, so actually I'm functioning, he's saying, like, like a Gentile king. Uh, but the trouble is, um, he's not. Uh, he's a Jewish king, and he's, and he's coming out of a, a setting which is the promised land in which they've lived. So this is going to undo him in a way. It seems quite sensible, but it's actually not wise. So in, one, in chapter 3, he marries Pharaoh's daughter to form an alliance. He formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the house city of David until he'd finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. 
People were still sacrificing in the high places because there were no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. So our writer wants us to understand that sacrifices were taking place on the high places, that is, the previously occult centres of where every green tree was. <clears throat> green trees are evergreen trees. Evergreen trees are a big deal in a fertility cult base because they think they go on forever and don't lose their leaves. So the, the understanding of annuals and, per, and perennials and, and constantly evergreen trees is, is a real tricky thing for the ancients. They thought an evergreen tree was really a very, a very, a, a tree with life in every season, as it were. Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except, except he sacrificed burnt incense on the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. Now you should notice, just sticking your finger in that, if you look at 2 Chronicles 1.3, which of course, this text is running parallel to Chronicles. That's why I'm not reading them both. 2 Chronicles 1.3. You'll notice that Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place which is at Gibeon. For God's tent of meeting was there, which Moses, had, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. David had brought up the ark from God from Kiriath-Jerim to Jerusalem, but the tent of meeting is still in Gibeon. You just need to know that, or you might wonder why he went there. Turning back, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice, therefore that was the great high place. See, this writer doesn't tell you it's where the tent of meeting is, but it is, according to the chronicler. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. It's a lot. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and he said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Now this is a very rare event when God actually says, I'm open for asking. Now, there's a couple of other places where it happens, but it's in this case, uh, God is obviously um, is asking him for that. There is a second visitation of this. And we'll come to look at that in, chapter, in verse chapter 11, but and one in nine as well. Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father. According as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart towards you, and you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, which of course is daily life. And your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. So, give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? It was a pleasing thing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and he said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. And I've also given you what you did not ask, both riches and honour, so that there will not be any among kings like you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. Whence then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. Do we have any sense that he knows he ought not be doing this in a high place? Well, we don't know that. 
do we do we see he returns and does worship at the Ark of the Covenant? He does that. Now, as you know, when God gives a, a man a new heart, an internal transformation inside his inside his very person, the, the only way you can ever test this is to see what he does. You 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 look at his deeds, and so our writer records the, the famous statement of the two deeds of the two harlots, the two prostitutes who come to the king and said. My Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. It happened on the third day after I gave birth that this woman also gave birth to a child and we were together and there was no stranger with us and no witness, only the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on it. And so she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your maidservant slept and I laid him in her bosom and, and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead son in mine. So someone switched babies. When I arose in the morning to nurse my son, he held he was dead, but when I looked at him carefully in the morning, he wasn't my son whom I had born. The other one said, no, 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 for the living one is my son, the dead one's your son. But the first woman said, no, no, the dead is yours and the living one is mine. And thus they spoke before the king. Not an easy question. No, no witnesses, no, no third no third base. And so Solomon gives an answer which will exploit the serious reasoning from, from one. He, he, will, he, will, he will discern. The king said, the one says, this is my son who is living. The other son is dead. The other says, no, your son's a dead one. My son's a living one. The king says, get me a sword. So they bring him a sword. And he says, divide the living child into two and give half to the one and half to the other. So this is an existential wisdom, a wisdom of the moment. Now, it's an important problem to see that, that, that there is no morality issue where you propose something absolutely crazy and seemingly, useless, seemingly odd. And this looks like this is a very unwise king indeed who's about to divide a child up, which, of course, with the implication at the loss of its life. We have two dead boy babies now. Well, the woman whose child was a living one spoke to the king and she was deeply stirred over her son. She said, Lord, give her the living child and by no means kill him. The other said, he shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide him. No. The king said, because see, the other one has said, this is the judgment of the king. But the king hasn't made a judgment. He's put forward a judgment to flush out who's... Yes. And the king said, Give the first woman the child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was with him to administer justice. And remember, to administer justice doesn't mean to give people punishments. It is to actually settle disputes. So it's quite important to understand a civil comprehension of law. You always got to do that in, in Israel, in, in Jewish law, isn't it? Because most law is essentially a civil issue uh, of dividing between uh, opposing parties or someone's wrong, someone else. And um, it's not a matter of, uh, it's not a matter of justice, it's not a matter of always of punishment, it's a matter of, uh, of wisdom and doing what is right and finding what's right. So it's in this place, this is a good example, that God had given him a changed heart. Interestingly then, that the king, and this is important for Solomon, the king is understanding that he is a servant of God with regard to his people. So he has to sort things out. And His greatest problem, he thinks, is I don't, I'm a child. I don't have experience of coming out and going in. I'm not a wise person. Um, uh, I'm not very astute and I'm not a man of the world who's got a lot of experience I just need some wisdom and this is the sort of wisdom God gave him by the way this opens up an important idea for us uh, sometimes God does something towards us which we think is a final statement because we think all of God's statements are final whereas in actual fact they're not at all they're designed to test us and then our response to that will be the thing which he was seeking and it's a very important thing to recall in dealing with God, particularly in our life, because we're dealing with God who's ongoing with us all the time. And so there's nothing final happening. I mean, on the great day, 
when God does make judgments about people, it's final. It's a, it's a final moment. It's a, no one will gainsay it and no one will change it. But, but sometimes God gives, gives you a, a, an implication of certain things and tells you to, uh, uh, often, you know, when we um, have a mind, to do certain things, we do it. And we think God is with us. And then he exposes that really we've got our own agenda. And then we think, oh, was this really the Lord? Did I discern it right? The answer is he let it run. And then having seen your own self uh, better, well, then we're now in a place to say we won't do that anymore. A classic place is where we begin to pray about some matter where we don't have much idea. And we pray as according to what we think is right. And then halfway down through the track, we suddenly discover our prayers are changing. And we've stopped praying the thing we first began, and we're now praying another thing. And that's because God has taken us where we are and started with us and let us go on talking and praying about it, but he's taken us to somewhere else. And then our prayer changes in response to that. This is going to be quite an important uh, development. And when you mentioned God testing us, that's totally different to the statement God tempting us. Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's true, all tests of God are a test to see if you'll do what he would call what is right or true or appropriate. But all tests often involve a temptation to not do what is appropriate as well. So the testing side is a testing side from God's side of his people. If you said to God, what is your mind about this? It is to discover what was in your heart good example is when God took them into the wilderness remember he took them he, he said that I took you into the wilderness to test you to see what what was in your heart to expose your heart and lo and behold I found out a lot of things I mean I found out that you're really not you're not really very reliable with me so that so the wilderness was a place of testing now, the same is true in the Gospels. Jesus is taken into the, into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested. But actually it says to be tempted of the devil. But a test and a temptation are simply the same action from two sides. The devil is out to tempt us so that we may fall over. God is out to test us so that we may triumph and do what is right. We are the meat in the sandwich. <clears throat> and our issue is, shall we, what shall we do? Uh, are we under strong temptation to do what is wrong? A, a demonic movement? Yes. Are we under a strong exhortation to, uh, and test to do what is right? Yes. A, a Godward movement. So in all of the testings of people or the temptations, there is a, a double-sided position to take. But the character of God is such that he tests and the will of Satan is such that he tempts. Because yeah. he has a mind about God himself, which is to make us fall over. And there's a growing element too. It's a growing... Yes. It'll... Holiness, holiness, righteousness. Yeah, that it grows. And we, we, we move from one step to another and we don't go back. We, mm. We're always on the increase of of uh, godliness if we choose what is right it will lead us to to increasingly choose what is right and to increasingly choose what is wrong will lead us to increasingly do that uh, you, you, you go down a path by a series of uh, sequential steps which are and you often see that with people's lives isn't it that you see people who've lived godly lives they they sustain and then there are people who live wicked lives and they just go further down the track and they seem almost to be inexorably going down there the answer is it's telling us that decisions of will are decisive for the way in which we, the experience of sin draws us into a place where we can be taken over by it So would you consider Abraham offering Isaac as, as one of those tests of God to, hmm. it's not a final no, so no, it's a no. Test to see his response. I, I agree. Yes, it's a place where God said, "Do it," and he said, "Ooh, all right," and didn't understand, mm -hmm. 
And then when he got there, he did understand that God wanted to know his heart, that I, now I know you, you trust me. Mm. So yes, it was a test of God and it looked wrong. Mm. And, and you see this a lot when, well, you see it with Solomon. Someone, someone would actually, standing behind Solomon as a local elder, would have yeah. said, this is dreadful. What sort of a king is this? We're going to cut up a baby in half. Hello. I mean, this is nonsense. <laughs> this, this is hardly wisdom. But actually it flushes out the... Yeah, yeah. So sometimes kings do things that are not always final, but are on the way to finality. You've got to allow for that. What we do often uh, in our understanding of, of the growth of children and the bringing up of children is to actually understand that very thing, that we, it looks to them like we've made a very serious decision, but actually we have an ability to pull back. Uh, but also we're flushing out a result because we understand that it's not a matter of someone making a pronouncement about your life. It's a matter of someone making what seems to be a pronouncement and your response is going to be decisive to this issue. Now, that's it's by the, same, by the same token, the same issue with salvation issues. You preach the gospel of salvation to people and, and they are, in fact, people for whom Christ has died and all is done. Yes, but what will their response be? Oh, well, that will... That will be that will flush out a response, mm. and that response will be important and significant. Chapter four: The king Solomon was king over all Israel, and these are his officials. There's a big, long list of them. I'm not going to bother you with that. But notice in verse twenty, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So they're getting, they're getting abundant. They're eating and drinking and rejoicing. And he ruled over all the kingdoms from the river. That would be, in this case, um, the Tigris-Euphrates complex, uh, to the land of the Philistines, that's to the Gaza Strip, uh, and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So Solomon inherits this enormously expanded Davidic kingdom and then he consolidates by, uh, by his technique of, uh, of um, diplomacy. And it says they brought him tribute. That is to say they were prepared to yield to his authority. His provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores. They're telling us what a core is somewhere here. You'll probably get a little... Someone with a Bible will tell us that. 375 bushels. 75 bushels. And then we go 375 to... 375. 375 bushels. 13.2 kilolitres. That's what my <laughs> <is>. <laughs> Wonderful. I was about to apply to the ancients among us about a bushel and, and, uh, and, 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 and go, uh, back, go back to that. A bushel, as I understand it, is a unit of the volume. Three bushels to a bag. Three, three bushels to a bag. To a bag. Three, three, bushels to a bag. three bushels to a bag of wheat. Yeah. 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 It was around about 100. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so it's about, about 60 pounds of bushels. 60 pounds of bushels. Mm -hmm. Converting the kilograms. Yeah. Very good, Ian. Thank you. Being Three bushels to a bag of wheat. And so bushels is about 60 pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this presumes... Anyway, <coughs> this is a lot. Now, this is an important problem because do you remember when, when they applied for a king to have a king... Do you remember that Samuel said, now I want to tell you, kings are expensive. And, and they'll run you short of money because monarchies are a very expensive business. Well, here it comes. So he had dominion over everything west of the river from Tipsha to Gaza. Over all the kings west of the river, he had peace on all sides around him. Judah and Israel lived in safety and every man under his vine and under his fig tree. You need to remember that. That's a comment of Jesus to Nathaniel. I saw you under your fig tree, meaning I saw you at ease. I saw you when things were good for you. And um, from Dan to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And he had 40,000 stalls of horses and swift steeds, 12,000 horsemen, and those deputies provided by King Solomon and all who came to Solomon's table. Each his month, they left nothing lacking. So he fed an enormous entourage. Mm. 
They brought barley and straw for the horses and swift steeds to the place. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind, like the sand that's on the seashore. His wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the, of all the something sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, and Kelkol and Dardaran, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was known in all the surrounding. And he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were many, thousand odd. And he spoke of trees, from the cedar that's in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things. So he's a man of science, a man of descriptive science. Men came from all the peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Now this is very important, isn't it? Because Jesus will make that clear when he's talking to what, to Chorazin and Tyre and Sidon and saying that there's a greater than Solomon here and you, you missed it. Now there's a relationship that's going to come out of this and we're, and we're about to head, of course, to some wisdom literature because I'm about to take you through the Song of Solomon and not an easy text indeed. I've got some notes for you as well, I think I do. If I can get this thing printing, but I'll do it at home if I haven't. Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon. Now, you remember that Tyre is up there on the Lebanese coast. And they, of course, are, 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 it's mountainous and they grow the most amazing cedar trees. And mm. this is their thing. He sent his servants to Solomon when he heard they'd anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always been a friend of David. And when Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, also in the man... No, I can't I'll turn two pages... Uh, you know that David, my father, was un unable to build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which surrounded him until the Lord put him under the soles of his feet. Put them under the soles of his feet, the people around him. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. Now verse 3 would imply, wouldn't it? Remember that when David applied to build the house of the Lord, God said to him, no, you're a man of blood. And you might have taken that to mean he was discredited and disqualified in some way. This text is interpreting it as he was unable to build the house because of the wars which surrounded him. He was too busy killing people and establishing order. Uh, so verse 3, uh, you know, uh, in this particular setting of 1 Kings, is interpreting that as David was too busy making war to be building stuff. I presume you build in quieter times, which you do. Now the Lord had given my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. And behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to David my father, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he will build the house for my name. Now therefore command that they cut for me cedars from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will give you wages for your servants according to all that you say, for you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. Do you notice he is not paying for the trees? He's paying for the labour to cut the trees, since trees are not owned. Mm. And so these are natural forests. And this is an important issue in the ancient world. Um, I mean, if you go to uh, Naples today, isn't it? You look to the east, you will see that all that all that, all that, it's all it's all denuded of trees because since the Roman times, people have cut down stuff to do whatever they need. I mean, if you if if you're laying siege to a city, you just rob every tree around, mm. and you just build with with red you know with um, with wet wet timber and and the issue is to understand that uh, if that's the case well the trees are for the taking no one owns trees no one farms trees technically in a sense came about when Hiram heard the words of Solomon he rejoiced he said blessed be the Lord today who has given to David a wise son over his great people and so he sent word to Solomon, saying, I have heard the message which you sent me. I'll do what you desire concerning the cedar and the cypress timber. They can probably cut cypress timber 
on their own, don't you think? That's a very nasty timber to, to turn, isn't it? It's very knotty. It's very knotty. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to your lungs as well. Is that isn't it? cypress pine or cypress? It'll be cypress pine. Cypress yeah. pine. Mm. So, in this case, they did it. My servants will bring them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will make them into rafts to go by sea to the place where you direct me, and I'll have them broken up there, and you shall carry them away. Then you shall accomplish my desire by giving food to my household. So this is something coming back in kind. So Hiram gave Solomon <coughs> as much as he desired of the cedar and the cypress timber, and Solomon gave Hiram... 220,000 cores of wheat as food for his household. And he would do that year by year. This, this was a, an annual allotment. So this is, you appreciate, this is a vast amount of food mm. which is being sent across the border. Uh, and this is in, in, in lieu of the fact that we are building a temple. And the Lord gave wisdom to Solomon just as he <coughs> promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon. And the two of them made a covenant. Now here comes your difficulty. These are the three things that bring Solomon down are <coughs> his marriages, his corvée, C-O-R-V-E, acute, uh, which is a French word meaning a, um, a system of taxation where everybody works about one month in three for the king. <coughs> Solomon levied forced labourers from all Israel, and the forced labourers numbered 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in relays, and they were in Lebanon a month and two months at home. And, Adar and Adoniram was over the forced labourers. Solomon had 70,000 transporters and 80,000 hewers of stone in the mountains. That's a lot of people. Besides Solomon, 3,300 chief deputies who were over the project and who ruled over the people who were doing the work. So these are the <coughs> project engineers, but they're not really. They're more particularly people beating up people to get them working. 3,300 foremen. Yeah. Then the king commanded and they quarried great stones, costly stones, to lay the foundation of the house with, with cut stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the, and, the, and the Jebelites cut them and prepared the timbers and the stones to build the house. So this is how things are done in the ancient world, isn't it? It's just massive numbers of people. Uh, it's, it's, it's brute labour. And, uh, and you go and get the people who are experienced to do what? In the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt... Now, that's the first date you've got in this book. That's a very important date. The 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So our writer is understanding something. Tell me what's being put down just in these verses. There's something very important here. A major issue is the building of the house of the Lord. This is the, the first temple, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. And this first temple is going to be is now given a date. Uh, you've been given almost a, a chapter, well, it, well, almost a full chapter on uh, how do we manage it. Uh, it was a big enterprise. And it was a very important house. And the building of the temple is now described in, pardon me, in great detail. So chapters 5 and 6 are going to tell, tell us this. Uh, I'm hurrying because I want to get you to a good place where you'll see something beautiful. So I'm just going to rip straight through chapter 6. Where, for the house which Solomon built for the Lord, the length was 60 cubits and the length and the breadth and so on and so on. And the house he made windows with artistic frames and against the wall of the house he built stories encompassing the walls of the house around, both the nave and the inner sanctuary. And thus he made side chambers all around. Verse 7, the house while it was being built was built of stone, prepared at the quarry. And there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house while it was being built. So this tells you that what they've done is that they've cut their timber and they've cut their stone 
pr to precision. And then they've brought it to the site and assembled it without doing that. Now, why is that? Do you remember there's, a, there's an issue here? God is actually saying, when you make me an altar, you make it out of stones you find on the ground. You pile them up, but you don't hammer them. And you don't shape them. I don't want an altar of mine which has got, got man's skills on it. I don't want that. I don't want it. Now, this is a compromise. This does have man's skills because it needs to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle and be stable and true. And, and, and the issue is that they do the work in the, away from the building. So it goes up just by assembly. I often think of it like, as I see sometimes in pictures of, is it the Amish people or others, the people who build these barns. They all cut their timbers and mortises and tenons and, and, and the men turn up with drays of carts and the thing goes up in an hour or two uh, because everything's pre-cut and it's just, it's an assembly job and it's done like that. I suspect this is the way of it. So he built the house and finished it and he covered the house with beams and planks of cedar. So the cedar is the facade and the stone, <coughs> is, the ro the stone is the strength. He built the stories against the whole house, each five cubits high, and they were fastened to the house with timbers of cedar. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying this, concerning this house which you're building, if you will walk in my statutes, <laughs> notice see how this goes, and, exhort, and execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will carry out my word with you, which I spoke to David your father. And I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. And then he built the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. From the, from the floor of the house to the ceiling, he overlaid the walls with wood and the, and the floor of the house was cypress. Um, he built 20 cubits on the rear part of the house and the boards of cedar from the floor to the ceiling and he built them for, for it on the inside as an inner sanctuary even as the most holy place. And the house that is the nave in front of the inner sanctuary was 40 cubits long. A cubit is a elbow to a tip. So that's roughly, I don't know, 18 inches, a little less, little less probably, depending on the... But it's fairly consistent with a sample of men over the years because uh, this distance seldom changes, even for a big man to a small man. I guess it went for a small person. There it is. The house is in the name of the front. Cedar on the house he prepared in a sanctuary and, and, it's, and then he overlaid that with gold. And so Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold and he drew chains of gold across the front of the inner sanctuary, verse 23, 22, and he overlaid the whole house with gold and the whole altar of the inner sanctuary. Uh, then he carved, do you notice, cherubs of ten cubits, both the cherubim were of the same measure and the same form, and the height of one cherub was ten cubits, and so was the other. And he placed them in the midst of the house, and the wings of the cherubs were spread out, so that the wing of one was touching the other, and the, their wings were touching each other in the centre of the house. Now you could understand this, couldn't you, if you read Isaiah 6, that uh, I saw the Lord in the temple. And the cherubs had their two wings touching, and with two he covered his face, and with two at his side, six wings, and, he, and with two he flew. This is a picture. Mm. He carved the walls of the house around about with carved engravings. He overlaid it with gold in, in the inner sanctuaries. The entrance was made of olive wood, the lintel and five-sided doorposts. So he made two, door, two doors of olive wood and he carved on them carvings of cherubim and palm trees and so on. Notice that the, that the, um, the doorposts were uh, a, a, essentially a, a, a pentagon. They've got five facets, it would seem. In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv and in the eleventh year in the month of Bul which is the eighth month the house was finished. So he was seven years in the building of it. Now, in the ancient world, this is a pretty fast movement, and this is a vast, this is a vast arrangement. And uh, you appreciate that. Uh, a pharaoh would spend 
uh, the whole of his life having his pyramid built for his tomb so that at, 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 a, at a vast cost and with just endless labour has been happening. Now, we're about to now to see chapter 7 will actually uh, give you um, um, the lowdown of what the temple is doing with regards to what's inside it. And uh, there'll be a sea. Uh, a sea is a great big basin of water, which is enormous. It's as big, it's big as this room. And, and this was for washing. Uh, because Solomon is obviously understanding this is the central place where worship is going to take place and there's going to be just so much activity here. Um, and so he's got cedar on the walls. He has cypress on the floors, which is a harder wood than cedar. And it's important to notice that all this is beautifully uh, done and he's got some very clever people um, to do the work. So if you look at chapter 7, you would notice that we're now seeing something which is mirroring the uh, tabernacle as it came off the mountain. So we just want to make sure that we, we understand this is a purpose-built building. It's not something some architect has designed for fun. And do you remember what, what it was in the early days? There was a holy of holies with a curtain. And then there was an outer side, this is the tabernacle, um, in which there was um, the laver and there was a, and there's a preparation and a burning place. And then there was a more outer section or outer porch in which Gentiles could come actually um, and, they, and here the people would gather. And into the holy place and then the holy of holies once a year once per annum and remember we said this is this is a place where god is present but not gettable too much and this is as you know in the in the in the um, uh, in the wilderness this has got poles with purple sides and and it all disassembles and you pick it up People carry the poles, people carry the fabric, and the thing is set up, and all the things that are inside it are set up. But once it's set up, this is how, how it works. Now, the temple is actually running to this, except that we have a nave, we have a big, a, a big area, and, uh, and then we have not buttresses, but we have stories <coughs> built up on top of it. So, so the temple is actually looking something like this with five cubits up the side and a big entrance place. So it's a big building and it's important to know it's a big building by ancient standards and it's a very rich and beautiful building and it's stacked full of gold. This becomes a real problem uh, towards the end of um, our section of the kings because uh, a certain king shows people what's inside. Now... What I'd like to do is n not go on because what I want to do is take you through very carefully um, 1 Kings 8 as a whole study because 1 Kings 8 is just too beautiful to not understand and it's central to this whole issue which is Solomon's great prayer about this house. Let's take a break here, I think, and just notice that, that um, what our man has established for us quickly is Solomon's wisdom. He's dealing with, he's cleaning up and establishing the kingdom, which is the code word for all, all past matters are sorted. There is a matter of wisdom. Then there is this matter of building of the house. And there, and there is this um, alignment between Hiram of Tyre and... Uh, Solomon himself and um, so we're actually working something up here I mean this is Galilee and we're down here in Jerusalem and Hiram of Tyre is is running up here and he's got mountainous cedars and he's cutting them and floating them down probably around about Caesarea 
although it's not a big port at this time, and then it's being trekked across to here. And he's, he's cutting uh, stone from quarries and bringing them together. I think the stone is mainly limestone in this part of the world, so it's not difficult to cut as to it's a soft stone, but it would be cut very accurately, and they'll be massive, big mass. Interesting to know how they sawed up all the logs. It's a lot of wood. It's a lot of wood, isn't it? It's a lot of wood. I imagine they worked a pit method. Yeah. And smooth it off. Labor intense, isn't it? Yes, yes. What, what do you mean pit method? The pit method is something which was used in this country, wasn't it, mm. to, to make sleepers out of jarrah and mm. hard things. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a man. Um, uh, you appreciate that when you when you're cutting when you're cutting a log cross cut, that's not a problem because two men just work push pull push pull, uh, and uh, and the sawtooth has a certain sort of style on it. But once you want to cut longitudinally, you dig a pit, and um, and the and the and the log is placed over the top of the pit, something like that, isn't it, Graham? Mm -hmm. And a man, who's, who's who's called the underneath man, because he gets covered in sawdust, uh, he is pulling the saw down. So he's the puller, and then a man is sitting up on top, lifting, mm -hmm. and so these men they they get a rhythm up. They they. This is their trade. And, they, and so a man straddles the log and they pull the saw back and forth and then move it through the log and cut a longitudinal plank. <laughs> the other way is to uh, axe it, isn't it, with an adze and break it. Yeah. Split it. Mm. Split it. And uh, in the ancient world they would often split timber, um, split logs with a nice longitudinal grain, so a big, fast-growing tree, mm. and then they would split these, and these become the things that are on top of roofs. What do you call them? Shingles. shingles. Mm. So the shingles are split, and and boards and some other things are sawn. Early sleepers were split. Too. Were they? Mm. Right. they yeah, and, and, and old fence posts, aren't they? On, Oh, those old fence posts on, on your yeah. farms, they would have been split, weren't they? Split. Because you can often see their well, sort of... We used to cut fence posts out of jam trees. Yeah. You know, up on the... Uh, you get jams. You remember that, Graham? Jam We used to cut that jam... Well, that was the name of the tree. <laughs> they had all these different jam posts. I suspect the acacias they talk about was something like jam, because jam is very... Hard? Resistant, resistant to ageing or rotting or white ants. Mm. Amazing okay. timber. Okay. And when you cut it, it's beautiful raspberry jam. Really? Colour? No, uh, the colour is dark, like um, uh, blackwood. You know blackwood? Mm. Furniture mm. timber? Mm. That's an acacia too. Yeah. Uh, acacia. Mm. So what do you mean, Jan? Oh, okay. Jam, it's a dark, uh, part wood and it's a yeah, yellowy oh, okay. sapwood, very contrasting. Mm. Mm. Pretty. Most, most beautiful wood. Mm. But the, last, the post just lasts better than the jarring there. Yeah. Right. They would just sit there forever. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. Right. The house stumps as well. Mm. Oh, that's right. don't, don't, that wouldn't yeah, rot. Nothing mm. touched no. it. Nothing touched it. Well, how did you drill the holes in them for uh, wires? It was fine, but it was great. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't all that hard. I think it was the mm. sap in it that, you know, the smell was terrific. Mm. Strong smell of raspberry jam, so I suppose that kept the right. termites away. Right, right. So and would it set hard? Yes, it's hard. So, so easy to work green? But yes, but it sets hard, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. Right, tonight then, we've seen the building of the temple, and, and if you want to, read carefully through what's in it. It's, it's quite important to know what's in it. It begins to form quite a bit. And by the way, it will form the picture of God's house in the minds of, as, as we shall see, 
uh, Solomon will be very careful to state God doesn't live here, but he will, he will cut some fine distinctions in his prayer. But what's important is to see that if you said, what's our God like? A lot of this is conveyed by his house. And that's why it's worth a study to look at it. But tonight we should call a break. Now, Father, thank you that we could even look at this. We also praise you that there are things here about the establishment of Solomon's reign where you are gifting him and giving him ways to govern his people. Well, they're your people, really. And the king is standing in your place, delivering your wisdom to his people. We'd like understanding ourselves as we see the later part of Solomon's reign and the difficulties that arise, uh, certainly within his household. And we'd like to ask that you'd give us wisdom as we read on and understand what we need this together. And we ask in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen.